Welcome everyone to today's event, Neurodiversity and Intersectionality, a virtual series hosted by the Rowan University Center for Neurodiversity. The Center for Neurodiversity is a cultural center within Rowan's Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with two aims, to situate neurodiversity in DEI initiatives and to provide initiatives that value and prioritize neurodiversity and disability culture. We are honored that our speaker today is Dr. Marenike Kiwa Onaiwu, especially as Marenike's work has been instrumental to our learning around intersectionality and especially the intersections of disability, race, and gender. My name is Amy Accardo. I direct the Center for Neurodiversity, and I'm going to start by turning it over to Carrie Cormier. Carrie's also a faculty member at Rowan, as well as a PhD candidate, and she's going to get us started with a land acknowledgement and our session procedures. Good afternoon, everybody. We would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the lands that we each call home. As a settler here in Southern New Jersey, I acknowledge the land of the Lenni Lenape Nation. If you'd like to share your acknowledgement in the chat, please do so. Thank you. In terms of procedures, we would like to encourage choice of video on or off and encourage all ways of being and participating. Please note the session is being recorded and in staying in the session is, is consent to being recorded. Our guests will provide a talk, then we will move into a Q&A facilitated by our student leaders. Do feel free to place questions in the chat at any time, or if you, if you prefer your questions to be anonymous, we also have a Slido link that we will place in the chat. Thank you, Carrie. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our student leaders. Uh, Raymond Wass is a member of our Center for Neurodiversity Student Advisory Board. Raymond is a double major in subject matter education and history with a double minor in international studies and political science. He's a student within our College of Education and College of Humanities and Social Sciences. He currently serves as the president of the Beta Gamma chapter of Delta Alpha Pi and was recently elected to be the incoming president of our DEI Student Government Association. You wanna give a hi, Ray? Hello. Thank you. And Jules Schusterman is a member of the Center for Neurodiversity Advisory Board as well. Jules majors in educational leadership and social innovation, along with certificates in access, success and equity and American Sign Language. Hi everyone. Thanks. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jules to introduce um, Dr. Onaiwu. So Dr. Marinike Giwa Onaiwu, PhD, is an educator, writer, public speaker, parent, and global advocate whose work focuses on meaningfully, meaningful community involvement and leadership, disability, racial, and gender equality, dismantling stigma and inclusion and empowerment. Often drawing from per personal background as a person of color in a neurodiverse and serodifferent family, a late diagnosed adult on the autism spectrum, and relevant educational and professional experience, Marina K is a highly sought after prevent, presenter, consultant, and subject matter expert. Marina K, founder and principal operator of Advocacy Without Borders, has been an invited speaker at the White House, at the United Nations headquarters, a keynote speaker, and a presenter at numerous conferences, uh, and provides diversity, research, and disability consulting to several organizations. Marina Kay, a humanities scholar at Rice University, has been published by Beacon Press and Palgrave Macmillan, and will release a 2022 edited collection on neurodiversity in the Black community with Jessica Kingley Publishing. Thank you, Dr. Anaiwu, and we are ready to begin whenever you are. Thanks so much for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Is my volume okay for everyone? I hope so. Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm um, giving you all audio from the phone and I am going to share the screen <laughs> from my uh, from the computer. So thank you for being here today. Um, I really appreciate um, Rowan for hosting me. And so we are going to begin. And so um, this image that you see here celebrating neurodiversity, if you're able to see it, is an image that I actually um, got from your center that I really liked, um, how you were, were talking about the importance of defining 
and celebrating neurodiversity. And so um, on behalf of the Rowan University Center for Neurodiversity, I'm really happy to be part of this series. I know I've had some colleagues who've been here and spoken to you all. And, um, you know, so I'm just really um, grateful to be able to continue to share about this topic. And so again, just wanted to make a little plug for the, um, the Rowan University Center for Neurodiversity. If you um, are affiliated with Rowan as a student or as a faculty member or a staff person, I hope that you check um, them out, how they're trying to essentially um, build awareness, knowledge, and um, inclusion of the, you know, autistic and neurodivergent culture overall. But even if you are not, um, I think that there's a lot of great resources that are helpful for people in general. So I encourage you to go to um, Rowan University, R-O-W-A-N, you know, .edu, and you can search for the Center for Neurodiversity there. So I am here. Um, we we talked about this, Amy and I, some time ago, so prior to autism acceptance or awareness, depending on who you're talking to, month. Um, and so we had talked about um, the fact that Dr. Nick Walker was coming and all of these other things and some of the things that you all have done since launching in the fall. And um, so I'm really happy to be here um, on, you know, on, in Autism Acceptance Month because it's a month that can be quite variable for autistic people. It can be, autism can be somewhat draining. People mean well, but they, and in their efforts to raise awareness, they often um, <laughs> raise awareness in a way that, you know, you know, perpetuates stigma. So uh, acceptance is where we're going for. Acceptance feeds, you know, if you are aware of something, um, hopefully you can become, you can accept it and having greater acceptance can promote awareness. So they can work together, um, hopefully in a positive way. And um, I want to share um, a few things, a few accessibility items. So um, I start all of my presentations out with what I call my five C's of accessibility, uh, because I think it's important. And I do this whether I'm talking to someone in person, or whether it's virtual or it's hybrid, um, just because it's important um, for me. And so I'm gonna take a couple, uh, just a, a brief moment to share it with you all, um, the five C's. And so the first C is for comfort. I want you all to be comfortable because if you're comfortable, you will you know, engage better with the material. So I've got a couple uh, veggie muffins right here, some water, I've got some stimming devices, a fan, a lot of things. I'm sitting on the floor with my back against the couch, which is one of my favorite places to be. So I want like you to be comfortable as well. Um, Another C is for um, connect. And so um, whether that's using the chat feature, whether that's using social media, looking things up, um, connect with the material so that you can learn it and can have a greater understanding. Um, and then I've also got C's for consider. Please be considerate. So everyone here has different backgrounds, different circumstances, different um, levels of knowledge. Let's um, give grace and space. Let's not make this a place where we're canceling anyone or calling anyone out. We're all here to learn. Um, intersectionality, neurodiversity, all of these things are a part of all of our lives, no matter how we identify, because we are a part of this society. Um, so let's, you know, let's be respectful of others. Um, and then um, my last two C's are um, for, I've changed, they used to be for um, challenge and commit, but I've changed them in 2022 to change and continue. And the reason why is because the changes that we make, you know, you think about the ripple effect. Um, sometimes people may feel that they don't have whatever platform or whatever reach or whatever knowledge or access that they have. And you don't realize how much change you can create in your, you know, you know exponentially um, just by doing what you need to do, just by, you know, being brave. And so whether it's changing your perspective, changing the, the terminology that you use, um, taking small steps to change things about the, you know, implicit bias and the ableism that's embedded in all of us. Those are positive changes for our world, world. and continue. So keep, it, it can be very tiresome. You see a lot of people saying, I'm giving up on academia. And a lot of us understand why they're giving up on academia. Um, or you see people, you know, there's just a lot of life changes going on. And so, and that's important, you know, and so while, so we're gonna continue to develop and be in the classroom of life, our entire lives, as long as we live. So I ask you to be the change. If you're a professor, if you're a, a researcher, if you're a student, if you're a parent, if you're a combination of all of those things, whoever, whatever you are, there's someone that listens to you. There's someone that, you know, thinks that you have, a, you know, a perspective worth considering. There's someone that you can hopefully promote neurodiversity and, and um, intersectionality with in your life, in your day-to-day -day life. 
And speaking of day-to-day -day life, so we got the virtual thing going on. So if you have babies, I've got two upstairs. They didn't go to school today. It's a long story. Um, so if you've got babies, fur babies, or you know, someone doing landscaping, you might have some background. Again, let's remember we talked about consideration. Let's just be considerate of one another. I'm just glad that everyone is here and that we'll have some time for this presentation and then some have some time for Q&A as well. Um, so I um, just want to give a couple of disclaimers. Um, I am fortunate to be receiving an honorarium from um, Rowan Center for Neurodiversity, and I greatly appreciate that because that gives me an opportunity there to um, help. Um, I do, you know, consulting, coaching, support, um, I help parents with IEPs and so forth. And so this work allows me to help um, individuals who do not have the ability to pay and still need to have services. And so thank you very much for that. Outside of that, I'm not affiliated with Rowan, but I do think you should still check them out. I really um, like what they're doing. Um, you know, for having launched a new Center for Neurodiversity, they've got a lot of resources and a lot of really great goals. Um, another um, disclaimer that I want to give you is as a disabled person, um, I my presentations are heavily image-based. And so um, I, because I have limited time and limited staff, um, I typically do not create image descriptions ahead of time. There are, of course, if you were to click on the material, there are the ones that are you know, like computer generated, which aren't always accurate. Um, but if you do need image descriptions, um, because I want everybody to be able to have what they need, um, although it's it would be more ideal to have it beforehand, uh, there'll be a slide at the end with contact information. You can reach out to my part-time staff. And if you do so, they'll, send, they'll create and send uh, more detailed image descriptions to you. So just want to get your attention really quickly um, that this is essentially about 40 minutes of talking, including this intro part. So I'm going to have to talk faster soon. Um, but also, I just want to share that some of the things that I'm going to be talking about with regard to neurodiversity and intersectionality might have some content that's potentially triggering. I'm going to be talking about discrimination and I'm going to be talking about um, you know, like a, a variety of things that might be a little challenging. So please remember my five C's, comfort. If this is something, if that is a topic that you need to mute for a while or step away and come back, um, please do so. So I'm gonna do a quick, quick, quick little icebreaker. Um, and I'm only doing that because I'm gonna read exactly. I, I've always thought these things were silly, but you know, for the last few years, I've been researching a lot of things about them and um, their purpose is to make people more comfortable with one another, energize the group, initiate creative thinking, encourage involvement. So since that's what we want, um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer and you have no idea what I'm gonna ask you, too bad, but. <laughs> But if someone will, I don't know if they have the ability to raise their hand like with the um, remotely. Um, if you all could just tell me whose hand you see first and, um, and I will call on that person and ask them a question. And if they are using the chat feature instead of, that's fine too. I just can't monitor them both right now. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I raised my hand. Um, I'm a student worker at the Center for Neurodiversity. And I'm awesome. Thank you. So I see Sarah, I see Heather, hey Heather, and Nikki. So I'll you the three of you will be my my volunteers. So I'm going to ask you a question. So we have an hour together today, right? Um, in that time, the typical McDonald's franchise is going to sell a lot of burgers. I want you to guess: Are they going to sell a hundred thousand burgers in this hour? Are they going to sell two hundred seventy thousand, or are they going to sell five hundred thousand? I'll go with 500,000. Actually, interesting. Um, now, post pandemic, it's actually more like 270,000. People are utilizing, now that there's a lot of places that are doing delivery and, and pickup, people are utilizing, having a lot more options than they used to. So the fast food industry getting a little run for its money, but good guess. <laughs> okay, and so Heather, you're next. Hmm, let me think of a good one for you because you, you, I got to trick you since I know you. <laughs> Okay, so Heather, in um, the av an hour, approximately how many people would you say, if you had to give a number between one and 20,000, uh, approximately how many people would you guess would be your, I guess your, your two best guesses of how many people will um, say I do and will you know, join in partnership or holy matrimony? The matrimony in an hour? Yeah. Around the whole world? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, 
not counting virtual nuptials because I don't have research data for that right now. Okay, I have no idea. So I'm just gonna randomly guess 10,000. You're actually not too far off. It's between seven and 9,000. Yeah, so go. awesome. Yay. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot in an hour. Oh, on an, you know what, on average in an hour, not on a Wednesday, you know, that's a good question. It might be less, I would think it is. Um, this is just the, they just, this is just the median. So, or I'm sorry, the mean. And so um, our last guinea pig. <laughs> All right, so our, we have eyelashes and eyelids, we blink multiple times. It helps us to lubricate our eyes. It helps protect from debris. It helps us to regulate our visual stimuli so we're not looking at anything too much, too long and you know, getting a headache or what have you. So if you had to guess in an hour, how many times do you think that you blink? And I'll give you a couple of guesses. Do you think you will blink um, 200 times, you know, like maybe a thousand times or um, 4,000 times? I'm gonna go with 4,000. Cool, actually, so it's actually closer to 1,200. So actually that was a trick question. I didn't give any of the, the, answer, the true answers <laughs> in the choices. All right, thank you all for doing this icebreaker with me. I really appreciate it. And so I know um, that we, we have um, some content that we have to cover and there's a lot of us, but feel free um, to you know, drop any communication in the chat or in the Slido and we'll kind of come back to you all. Um, thank you so much. So um, my bio was shared a little earlier. Um, and so I am, I'm very passionate about diversity because it's something that I didn't realize um, for many years. I didn't know a lot about um, neurodiversity. I didn't know a lot about disability. Um, there were a lot of things that I didn't know. I grew up, my parents were immigrants to the United States. So I knew about, you know, anti-immigration, you know, sentiments. I knew about Islamophobia. I knew about race, you know, racism. I knew about sexism. Sadly, I learned a lot of this thing, this stuff young. I knew about ageism, how people mistreat people because of age. Um, as I got a little older, I started to learn more about homophobia and transphobia. I wasn't aware of that when I was very small. Um, but Unfortunately, you start seeing the, the real world. Um, and but I didn't, I really truly, and I know this is gonna sound ridiculous, but I really truly had no idea how interwoven ableism was in our society. Um, and not knowing I was disabled myself, I would have told you that most people are not, you know, do not discriminate against people with disabilities and that it's not a problem. And I would have been very wrong because it is very much a problem. And a lot of it is because of how much of it is insidious that people don't even realize. And so for me, I like to use my voice, my platform in whatever I do. Um, I'm a parent, you know, I'm also, you know, like I, I do consulting and advocacy, I've been in academia. Um, I do research, I'm more of a, um, of a transdisciplinary researcher. And I just try to use wherever I am to kind of, you know, promote this idea about, you know, the different types of minds that we have and that it's an okay thing, it, that different is not wrong. And so I'm gonna share a couple of frameworks because again, this is about um, neurodiversity and this is about intersectionality. And um, I want to say that these words get used a lot and you might be very familiar with them. You might use them, you might use them wrong or you might use them correctly. I'm not certain, but I'm just gonna kind of lay the foundation. I never like to make assumptions. You know, once an educator, always an educator. And I like to provide um, background um, and context and I'll do so. And then I'm gonna share some experiences and some, um, and some context and then we'll kind of go to the Q&A. So first, um, before we start talking about neurodiversity and intersectionality, we gotta back it all the way up and talk about identities because everybody has multiple identities, everybody. Um, I don't care if you're, you know, like some people will be like, oh, well, he's just a, you know, a cis head, um, upper middle class white male. Yeah, he might be that. He also might be left handed. He also might be Jewish. He also might be queer. He also might be, you, you know, um, neurodivergent. You know, all people have multiple identities. We're like, there's so many parts of who we are, not just one singular part. And all of those identities vary. You know, some are more noticeable than others. Um, you know, others, if some are, you know, more marginalized than others. You know, so no person has only privileged identities um, or only marginalized identities. We're a mix because, and we have to be because those things are in flux. They're different in, in different circumstances. Um, and so I give examples like, you know, living in the United States where I I am, I'm, you know, I'm a non-binary woman, so I'm a, a gender minority. I'm, um, a, I'm demisexual, so I'm queer, that's a minority. I'm a black, um, I'm of West African descent. Um, I could go on and on and mention a number of things. Those are all um, marginalized identities. But if I fly to, you know, where my parents are from in West Africa, um, I'm no longer a racial nor an ethnic 
you know, minority. I'm in a, you know, if, you know, in a group where there's a lot of people who can pronounce my name easily and, and um, might have the same, have even have the same name. And, and so I blend in, in that setting, I'm not um, a minority. Um, or we could look at things such as um, the ability to speak. Um, I am a part-time AAC or augmentative assistive communication user. So I type to communicate part of the time. It's probably not a day that goes by where there's a portion of the day that I can't speak. It's, it's physically and emotionally draining. It, it is something I'm able to do, but not all the time. But there are some individuals who Okay. Should have put my phone on do not disturb. Sorry. <laughs> so a person can be, let's say I'll think about one of my colleagues, Nico Boscovich, is white, heterosexual, male, uh, middle class, but types to communicate. And so um, does not get the same consideration that I get when I walk in somewhere and someone's like, oh, graduate degrees and oh, you can speak in the way that I'm do and therefore because of that that gives me privilege in those circumstances that he doesn't have you know he can't get past that ableism that's still a marginalization and so again we're more than our privileges and our marginalizations but those are very important to talk about because when we're talking about the concept of neurodiversity it comes from biodiversity um basically the heterogeneity of life that allows us to to have you know the the strength that we have to keep you know ourselves alive that's why they tell people you know the consanguinity thing creates problems because you don't have enough diversity in the gene pool. Same thing for, you know, the, for the world at large and same thing for our brains. Neurodiversity is a fact of life and we all have different brains, period. Just like we have different height, different blood types, different skin tone, different fingerprints, even two identical twins, you know, the, those individuals, their brain types are different from one another. And so it's important because although there are some ways of thinking and processing that are more common than the other, and that's what we, you know, people would call more neurotypical, um, all neurodiversity is a fact of life. So even two people whose brains are considered neurotypical, they think very differently from one another. And individuals who think differently um, than the, the norm, you know, who diverge from that um, are considered um, neural minorities, um, or again, Judy Singer used the term neurodiversity to talk about neurological di um, diversity. There's also some other terms, um, Kasiana Sasamasu um, cre um, came up with the term neurodivergent. Um, there is neuroqueer, um, which is um, used frequently by Remy Yergo, Dr. Nick Walker, um, Athena, um, Dylan, there is neuroexpansive, um, who is, which was created more for the Black and African American um, community, neurodivergent community by um, Ngozi Alston, and that some people have neurodistinct. There's like a lot of different terms, um, but it's the reality. It's our truth. And so just like approximately 90% of the population is right-handed um, and being left-handed, the 10% that's ambidextrous and left-handed is, is less than the in, in number, but that they're not worse off than then. However, the world typically creates things for right-handed people, the types of scissors and, you know, all of these other types of things that we do. And so similarly, a lot of our world is, is created in a way that doesn't really honor intersectionality um, nor neurodiversity. And that's a problem because intersectionality, the concept from Kimberly Crenshaw, and there's also a lot of great work from Patricia Hill Collins and others, you know, essentially talks about the marginalized aspects of our identity. So again, we have tons of, of, of identities, but the marginalized ones and how they overlap with one another and kind of like what that phenomenon is like, how it can complicate things in our world. Um, and the term comes from where she uses a, an, an intersection of vehicles converging at an intersection, you can't really predict, you know, which one is going to arrive at this part of the intersection first, or if someone's not paying attention, if they're going to collide. You can't predict that the situation either, if you're in a situation, if you're going to be um, viewed or perceived a certain way because of your gender, or because of your disability, or because of your, you know, your age, or what have you. And so um, because of that, unfortunately, neurodiversity um, essentially says that just like everything else in life, how we have, you know, we have different races and we have different religions and we have different cultures and they're different, but there's a hierarchy and there shouldn't be, but in society there is where some um, I have more, are more privileged than others are more, you know, common than others or what have you. Similarly, it's the same thing with neurotypes to where um, people whose brains operate in the way that's more neurotypical um, are things are designed for the way that those individuals think and process and not for the rest of us. And we're seen not as different, but as odd as disordered.
And so there's a lot of really great concepts. I'd encourage you if you don't um, know a lot about the disability justice framework to look it up. It's a 10 principles. It's a really um, amazing information. It talks about intersectionality and leadership of the most impacted and how different movements can work together and all of these other really important philosophies that um, kind of, you know, like really kind of like are an umbrella above this that we don't have time to get into, but they're really important because the roots of all of these things, intersectionality, neurodiversity, the roots of what we're facing, how it impacts our lives, they run deep. They run before any of us were ever born. They run before our parents were born and their parents were born. We inherited a real effed up world. <laughs> there's a lot of things that are, there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of ableism and we didn't create it. We, we didn't say, oh, okay, I'm gonna roll this dice and I wanna be born this race and this city and this you know, socioeconomic status. We get what we get, right? So we have the identity that we have. We have to contend with the realities that are around us but that's not about shaming anyone nor about lording oneself above others. That's just about the, you know, the circumstances that we have in the world that we inherited that we can change for the better. And so again, we all have different types of brains. Neurodiversity is a fact of life, whether we're talking about ADHD, uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, giftedness, um, autism, there's so many different things. And then and again, um, Kasiana Sasamasu, who is biracial Asian and white um, activist, um, also includes acquired um, neurodiver neuro neurological differences, so TBI, or um, some of the you know neurological changes people might have post COVID, or um, after contracting HIV, or what have you. And so um, they say again that it's just difference, but they you know pathologize that difference. My one of my diagnoses is you know autism spectrum disorder. It's not autism. It's not autism spectrum condition. It's disordered, chaotic problematic. And the things that we do, the characteristics, or some people would say symptoms of that, you know, are considered odd. And so it's interesting because it's very subjective. Just like, again, I talked about with intersectionality in one setting, you know, I am, you know, I am an ethnic minority and in another, I'm not, I just blend right in um, to what the neurotypical people find odd, you know, such as some autistic people or neurodivergent people may not make eye contact. And so, you know, people are forced to make eye contact. And, but to us, that can be kind of odd. And so this is just kind of like a, you know, like a, a playful, like satire. What if the, the, what if the norm was to look away and not to look into someone's eyes? This is the way that they talk about the characteristics that are natural to us, um, it, you know, it, you know, is in the way, and it's just, un, it's not right. It all depends on your perception of things. You know, what, what someone calls a disorder, another one, that's the way that that person thinks and lives. What someone thinks is, you know, a problematic aspect of something might just be someone who needs to develop more skills or needs to, you know, have, do things in a different way or have different support. It's really all about perception. Um, you know, our perception colors our reality. And so um, looking at intersectionality, you know, we have to look at the fact that, you know, again, all of these different identities that we have, you know, um, there it's, you know, there is real gender inequity, um, whether a person is assigned female at birth, non-binary, queer, trans, various circumstances. And even in some settings, like in some professions, um, you might be a cisgender male and might be a minority in that profession. Social workers, one nursing is another. Um, and so there are, for people to say that, that things are the same, they are not. Um, income is different. Um, look, if you look at the numbers of individuals who are in research studies, when you look at um, supervisory roles, when you look, there's a lot of things, there are huge disparities. And for us to pretend that it isn't there um, is just not realistic or helpful. There's also racial differences. And so, you know, most parents have to have the talk with their child about, you know, like puberty and life and, you know, things. And that's an uncomfortable talk, no matter what color you are, but you got to have it. But, um, you know, many people of color, myself included, my parents included, had to have the talk that with the, you are getting older, you will no longer have the shield of youth and you are noticeably racialized. This is how you can behave in a way to where people won't perceive you as a threat and hopefully you will stay alive. That's not the most heartwarming talk to sit down and have with your 12 year old, but when they're close to your height, uh, and particularly if they're neurodivergent, you need to have it because you don't know what circumstances they're gonna find themselves in. And they don't have, so in the situation, like I mentioned to you all, Nico and I could be right next to each other. I have my speaking privilege, but if we're driving, 
that privilege goes away. No one's caring about my speaking. They see a black face and I'm more likely statistically to be stopped than my white colleague, even though I might be a better driver. Probably not actually. And then there's ableism. This is something that impacts everyone with a disability and therefore by default impacts all of us, our entire world, um, because it's, uh, the, it's the, that inherent discrimination and a lot of people don't realize how, uh, again, it's very covert. They may not, it's in our terminology. Um, oh, you know, we were paralyzed by fear. You know, the economy was crippled by the COVID-19 virus. She blindsided me with that news. You know, oh, the weather is so bipolar. It was hot this morning, now it's cold. It's just, I mean, you know, it's just, just the way that, that's so lame, you know, don't, oh, that's so gay. I mean, it's all, all of these different things, these things that are a part of our terminology, there are things like that for every group, but there are so many for disability. Disability is kind of like the final frontier where it's still permitted to, to um, even if you're not openly being discriminatory, there's that way of speaking to disabled people like their babies or breaking things down or making assumptions or having lower expectations or making assumptions, telling someone, oh, okay, well, I, you don't have to make eye contact because you learn that they're on the spectrum. Maybe that person loves eye contact, but you've made the assumption from what you think that autistic people can't make eye contact, so this person must not. You know, we can't all be placed in one box in any of our identities. Um, and so essentially, um, the reality of life for, um, the, you know, for those of us dealing with intersectionality, dealing with neurodiversity, dealing with these marginalizations um, are two things. Either we're going to live a life where um, to survive, whether we like it or not, we mask in certain situations, we camouflage ourselves just to not um, draw attention to ourselves or to minimize danger. Um, and that can, there's a lot of research about the danger of that. Or we either can't or we don't mask. And now we're this weird mythical creature. We're inspiration porn. We're not relatable. Um, instead of you know looking at who we truly are, um, we are seen um, as this you know conception, you know this you know stereotypical image, be it positive or negative, that people have of us, and that impacts our real lives. And so, how am I doing on time? So I want to make sure we do have some time for questions. I have a couple more uh, um, things to share. Um, but I want to kind of give a few examples of how this has impacted people's actual lives. So this is a picture of a young, um, of a middle school child who um, is diagnosed with autism and his mother had asked for him to have, you know, an opportunity to have a quiet space that he needed to go to to work sometimes to, to self-regulate. And the school created a special desk for him in a restroom. That's his, that's the toilet and that's a desk over it. There's the sink and the chair. This is where this child, this is unsanitary. This is where he was placed. Because again, why should we waste money on that autistic kid? Just throw him in a, you know, throw a desk over a restroom and he'll be in there and he won't bother anybody. How humiliating it is to be treated in, in, in such a manner, um, to be, to not, you're paying taxes and you can't get the free appropriate public education that you're entitled to. Or just walking. You know, Maxfield Sparrow is a, a transgender autistic individual who has been harassed many times by the police because of, you know, their gait is different, you know? And so sometimes we might have stereotypy in our movements or some of us don't drive a great deal for various reasons. You know, there's some, you know, maybe it's, you know, hand-eye coordination or, or for whatever reason, but Maxfield has been stopped and accused of being um, intoxicated or, you know, under the influence of some substance just for walking while autistic. Um, and so again, as I mentioned to you, unfortunately, in both of the situations that I just gave you, these individuals were white, the whiteness didn't protect them from the ableism that is all in our, that's, that's throughout our society, unfortunately. And then we can look at other ethnic groups too. It happens in every group. Um, but there's a situation where it was a, a young um, Latin teen who was at El Pollo Loco with his family. And he, um, there are certain co-occurring conditions that appear more frequently sometimes in individuals with autism. ADHD is one, um, polycystic ovarian um, syndrome is one, Ehlers-Danlos. Um, some people have you know, are a tendency towards seizures or GI you know, issues. He started having a seizure. He was in the restroom. The, his sister called 911 and wanted to get the paramedics medics because you know, they were frightened. The police came grabbed the child, threw him down, yelling, and the mom is crying, he has autism, he has autism. The sister's crying, nobody's listening to them. They see a you know, five foot 10 Hispanic kid who's moving weirdly and they assume that it's violence. They injured and harmed this child and he was diagnosed with PTSD. 
there's Caleb Moon Robinson, who when he was 11, 11 years old in sixth grade, um, an African-American male with um, ADHD and autism, um, because the school made it a rule that he had to wait until everyone was out of the classroom and then have an aide come get him and take him from class to class, which is ableist. He was frustrated one day and he kicked a trash can. Um, and then they had a school resource officer, a police officer who came and, and grabbed him and, and you know, restrained him. And he was charged with two felonies of assaults that would have been on his record th throughout adulthood. Fortunately, the community spoke up against this, but again, being autistic, black, male, kicking a trash can, you know, the anger, you know, it's, it's apparently like felony assault. There is Reginald Neely Latson, who was waiting in front of the library <laughs> For it to open. He just needed 22 minutes for it to open. He was there a little early. And someone called and said, there's a suspicious black man in a hoodie with a weapon over by the school because the library is near um, a public um, elementary, middle school, and high school in that county. And they, pol the police came. Um, Neelai has, you know, intellectual disability and has some um, challenges with communication. They asked him a lot of questions. They, the loud sirens were bothering him and the flashing lights were bothering him and they were yelling and he was confused. And so he decided to just start walking away and they thought he was trying to evade arrest and they grabbed him and they hit him and he hit back and he ended up in solitary confinement and imprisoned for almost 10 years um, for the crime of being a black autistic person wanting to go to the library. And so this happens to so many people and it makes me wonder, this is a picture um, and it's not the most current picture, but it's, this is my, my little one in the corner. So there's only, there's two black kids in the class. There's actually more kids of color than you can see. Some of these kids are just kind of pale, but, <laughs> but the, the little boy, this is, that's my youngest son. He's bigger than that now. He's closer to my height. And I've had that talk with his brothers who are neurodivergent. I haven't had it with him, but I'm going to have, and I, I'm terrified that I'm gonna have to tell him, try to stand still, try not to you know, use echolalia, try not to stim because they might think you're hitting or you're reaching out. Um, I think about the circumstance where I had a stimming device. It wasn't this one, it was a coil and um, where I was stopped by the police officer who grabbed his gun. Fortunately, I was able to find my words. Um, but before that I had repeated what he said because that's how I process and he thought he was being mocked. You know, what would happen if my son, my husband is six five, if my husband, if my son ends up more like his dad's height than mine, I'm five three, then this isn't going to be very safe for him as a black world, as a black autistic male. So um, I want to talk about a couple of other things related to neurodivergence and intersectionality. And um, I'm so sorry, y'all. I just need to see what time it is. Okay. So I need to wrap up like in five minutes. I'm going to talk really quick so that we have time for the, the 15 minutes for questions and talking. So the, um, the, they say this fish, they consider this the ugliest fish in the world. Um, but the reason why is because when we take it out of its environment, it, it's gelatinous, it literally implodes. So we're killing it. The pressure that we're applying in our atmosphere is not healthy for it. In its own environment, it looks like a typical fish. you know. And so we need to, again, I talked about perception is key. We don't say, we, we pay seven figure salaries to professional basketball players. We don't say, oh, we need to find a cure for gigantism. You know, we don't do that. We don't, we don't say, oh my gosh, this, we need to cure this mutated baby who's redheaded because red hair is technically a mutation. We wouldn't, if someone said that, I think they'd be really off. This, this is one of the cutest babies I've seen outside of my own. We don't say, oh, you're left-handed, you're, you know, disgrace. Although there is discrimination against left-handedness in a lot of countries and a lot of places, but Rocky was a Southpaw. Many, um, you know, executives and even a lot of um, heads of state in a lot of countries have been left-handed individuals. Um, sometimes the truth is hiding in plain sight. If we just look, we can see more than what it appears to be. So quickly, because I know I want us to have time to talk, what are some things you can do? And I apologize for having to shut, go through these quickly and not give examples, but you can learn. You, you are never too old or too young or too educated or too anything to learn and unlearn. There's so many things about that we need to unlearn and there's so many things that we need to learn, all of us, every human being. There's lots of different ways you can learn. Um, there's, you know, sources. The book on the right is a free open access book um, from Palgrave Macmillan, um, edited by Stephen Cap. It talks about the autistic community and the neurodiversity movement's um, early history um, and, you know, things that happened in like the 90s and the 2000s and so forth. Um, it's totally free. If you Google it, you can download the entire book. You can download chapters. The book on the left, I'm a co-editor of is a book that was written from, um, you know, essentially a narrative style, uh, you know, for parents, you know, and people to learn about autism from the, the perspective of 
um, adults who w wish their parents knew some of these things. You can try to see and, you know, like talk and, and speak truth. Um, and so you, the terminology you use, don't use things such as high functioning, high, mild, severe. Um, don't use, you know, don't use terminology that hurts people and that um, belittles and others them. And also in the way that you walk, you know, walk the talk, that you live your life, be the change that you want to see. Um, when you're, do you have colleagues that, you know, what is your, what do your research teams look like? What do your, what does your staff look like? What do your volunteers look like? Do you have a range of individuals uh, of different neural types of different gender and age and, and ge geographic location? If you don't, why not? Because we need all of that. You know, they say that um, justice is what love looks like in public, you know, and, you know, that's often used a lot when we talk about inclusion. But I'd say that acceptance is what it looks like in private. I don't want to be tolerated. I don't want to be you to be aware of me. You can be aware that I'm on the ground bleeding, but are you going to do anything about it? I mean, your knowledge is not helping me. Acceptance is above all of those things. And so in closing, this is my contact information, um, my websites. Um, there is a frequently asked questions page on my website, which is um, Marenna K G O. So like more Nike geo.com FAQ. I've got links and different things about neurodiversity, autism and, and things that might be of, of benefit. If you would like to contact me or if you'd like um, image descriptions, please contact staff at advocacywithoutborders.org. And I'm at Marenna K G O on Twitter and um, I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and go into our q and I'm so sorry that we didn't have, um, that I, I think I took about five minutes of the time. And then um, also a few of you, five of you are going to win a free e-copy of Sincerely Your Autistic Child. We're going to do a, a drawing toward the end with the email addresses that you all use to log in with. So it's time for us to talk. And so I'm going to yield to my colleagues and thank you all for being here. Oh, these are great. So, oh, wait, so I'm sorry. I just see somebody asked me to go back to a slide. Oh, the contact slide. I'm sorry. Yes, I can. <laughs> and okay, so there's a slide. Oh, how did you start it with social justice advocacy? Oh, I'm sorry, Jules, you're supposed to do this, aren't you? I'm being a bad um, you're, you're good. Analyst. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, we can, we can start with that one. So like, how, how did you get started with social justice, self-advocacy, and what advice do you have for college students and other participants with intersectional minority identities? So it's, it's interesting, I'd say I probably started kind of by accident in high school and it was really just there were um, they there were a few clubs like there was one called students to end prejudice and there was some like volunteer opportunities. And so um, the some of the opportunities are ones I wouldn't have done if not for the fact that they were required. <laughs> um, because I just the socialization and all of that was difficult, but I did some um, volunteer um, opportunities that really opened my eyes to, you know, some, to some different circumstances that people had, and it really impacted me. And so when I went to college, I continued being involved with service. And so really, um, I just, I was always kind of involved because I always felt like I always felt different and it wasn't maybe the same difference that other people were having, but I always wanted to be involved. And so I started just with a lot of listening and learning and helping and just getting in where I fit in. I knew nothing, you know what I mean? Um, I'm sure I made a whole lot of faux pals, you know, but I learned and people were gracious enough to let me come along. And so in time, I started to use my voice, you know, whether it was writing letter to the editor, uh, whether it was writing public comment to like a school board um, or on social media, I just kind of, it started to go gradually and share things with people that I know. And so my advice would be um, learn, you know, ask questions um, don't be afraid. You don't have, you could have a following of two. Who freaking cares? If that stuff that you have to say is great and it gets to those two people, they'll pass it to two people and they'll pass it to two people. Um, I just want people, so if you're a college student, I don't think that, don't let somebody tell you because you don't have this letter or this accolade or this, that, that you can't make a difference. That's BS. You can, and you probably already are. And in terms of the intersectional minority identities, try to find some place that's an enclave for you, whether it's online, whether it's a friend group, whether it's a, a professor that you can confide in and an advisor, uh, whether it's some time away in the tub with some bubbles, find some time for yourself you can't give from an empty vessel. And I think that a lot of us want to give and we, we care so deeply that we, you know, we, we do disservice to ourselves and to the movement. So the, the, the advice will be just keep on learning and, and learning doesn't like public intellectualism happens everywhere. So there's gonna be brilliant people in the classroom and there's gonna be brilliant people out in the street and in the world. Take those concepts and, and, and you know, internalize them, learn from the experiences that you have and, and become better each day. 
Thank I'm you gonna, for your. Oh. No, it's okay. I was just saying I'm gonna put this email address in the chat for the person who asked. But continue, please. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's all good. So, um, so thank you for the response. Um, so for the next question, is anonymous. Is um, I have a friend that may be neurodivergent. Um, I don't know how. Like, I don't want to assume, but I want to support and make sure she's comfortable when we hang out. Um, should I bring it up? So it depends. Like for some people bringing it up is helpful and they, um, you know, appreciate that. And I'm sorry, y'all, I know it's probably weird. I've got but the computer and the phone on. So that's why you're seeing to me. But um, they, some people will, would be comfortable bringing it up. Some people would feel othered. So I think I really like that you're, what your goal is to make your friend feel comfortable and supported. And so what I would do is maybe instead of necessarily bringing up neurodivergence per se, say, hey, I've noticed that, you know, you, you hate when we go to such and such coffee shop, you know, because they have such loud music, you know, we can go somewhere else, we can sit outside or, hey, um, this, you know, like maybe suggest some of the things that you think has been helpful to, you know, or, or that they prefer or some of the preferences or, or make suggestions of things that would work. And that might lead into the conversation more like, you know, because I think regardless of what their neurology is, um, you want to, you, what, what's important is you want to be a good friend. You want to care, you want to be there for them. And so I think about when my son was in um, public preschool for children with disabilities, there were three, he was autistic and so was another little boy. And then there were, there were three little boys who had like cerebral palsy. There was one who had Down syndrome. So there was like, it was cross disability, but there were certain things they all loved to do that worked for all of them. And there are certain things that didn't work for them. So some things, um, it's, it depends. It's just so hard to know. It's so individual from person to person. Some people feel seen and validated if you mention it and other people feel called out. And we just, it's without knowing the experiences and without knowing where they stand. Um, and if they have any internalized ableism or if they're still figuring it out, I would, you know, kind of lean more on the friend part because that's the most important part there, you know, and, you know, and hopefully, you know, that will, you know, open doors to where either they or you can bring that conversation up in a way that feels authentic. So thank you. Um, the next question is with regard to young people of color, how can we acknowledge the realities with discrepancies with access to diagnoses without feeling like we're pushing a diagnosis um, that is also often steeped in pathology, racism, and gender bias? Wow. That question is amazing. That should be a whole presentation by itself. I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but the little that I'm going to be able to say is, I think it's very challenging. I think, um, and I think that it's, it, it requires us to think dialectically. It's kind of like people, you know, it's like I explained to people like disability has been misused against people. And that's why in some communities, there is so much ableism because it's been used as one more thing to other you or to deny you of things. And when you're already feeling like you have to work twice as hard to get half, or you already have things um, just by virtue of being born that are working against you, sometimes people have challenges adding more. And sometimes that label does not help you. I mean, everything is a label, you know, your name is a label, your, you know, zodiac sign is a label, but sometimes, you know, like I've told people that you have to really weigh the pros and cons. Like I know I, I live a very open life. Um, and, but I think my life would have been different if I'd had a little bit more, I just was so green and excited. And I didn't think about the consequences, you know, as, a, you know, I'm just thinking about sharing my voice and making change and not realizing that in doing so, I'm endangering, you know, my livelihood. Um, that I, that there are there's still a lot of discrimination against disabled parents and so forth. And so there are a lot of challenges that I un, un you know wittingly um, invited into my life um, by just kind of jumping out there. And so it's not that a person can't do so, but I think being informed is wise. And so for if, if is a person going to get any support or help? Is this diagnosis going to help them either, in, you know, as a person, like personally, or accessing things, accommodations, if it is, then maybe go for it. If it's not, then I think self-diagnosis is equally valid. I, I self-diagnosed before obtaining my clinical diagnosis. And, um, and we know there's a lot of barriers for young people and for people of color to get these diagnoses in the first place. So I know that's not a great answer. I apologize. It's a wonderful question. Thank you. So the next um, questions that we have, there's um, in the chat, there's two of them together. So um, for a question, the first question this um, person's asking is that um, one of the thoughts to be um, frequently systems of autism 
I have read about is rigorous mindset. Um, what advice would you give to those who may be struggling to separate their desires to be accepted of different differences from the desire to continue to follow ableist um, norms they live their whole life? And the second part to this question is, do you have any thoughts or early research that you may you are aware of that the discussion of intersection of the environmental racism and neurodiversity mindset is this a concern in your field? And so I'm going to do the second question first because there is a an investigator um, of color. Oh gosh, I want to say is it Dr. Aisha Diller? Oh, what is Aisha's last name? Um, I will find it, but she um, actually, so she received her, um, she did her um, doctorate and I think her postdoc at University of Texas Health Science Center. And I, I think her, um, I think she's also been with University of Alabama. She's been with a number of schools. She's actually um, a colleague of mine on the IACC. And she has done some um, research related to, um, to, the, to um, environmental racism and um, not just autism, but other developmental disabilities. So, um, I'm trying to see if I can at least give you her accurate name, <laughs> then you can, um, you know, like look up some of her work. Um, and um, with regard to the other part, um, it's complicated um, because I think that, you know, people do want to, you find yourself in this kind of catch 22, like you do want to be Aisha Dickerson. Thank you. And she's at John Hopkins or Johns Hopkins, I'm sorry, um, in the epidemiology department people do want to be accepted and they do want to be able to be themselves. It's kind of like, you know, it, 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 it you know, like warring against oneself and it's, it's very hard. And so I, I think sometimes it's situational, you know, to be honest, like some, like, I, you know, I've explained to people that I know I'm going to say no every time you ask me to something, but I still want you to ask me. I still want to feel, you know, like, you know, like you wanted me there, even if you knew I wasn't going to be there, you know, and so I think we need to work hard, like in terms of unlearning the ableist, you know, the um, ableism that's in all of our minds, that's in, in our lives, those biases, I think it takes time. Uh, it really takes time. It's, it's, we have to be very conscious. And, and I think that um, even sometimes we're trying to dispel um, you know, the stigma, we perpetuate stigma. Um, I think about an example that I used to give very early on um, in um, when people would ask questions about, um, you know, um, cognitive ability and um, functioning levels and, you know, what did, you know, people who they, they determined were quote unquote low functioning individuals who were non-speaking. And I remember I would get, you know, frustrated and I would list all of the different people that I knew who were non-speaking or minimally speaking, who had college degrees or who were brilliant or who were writers, who were this, who were that. And yes, that, those things were all true of them. So people should not make an assumption from what you see of a person's function level. But what I realized I was doing is I was stigmatizing people who were non-speaking who weren't because cognitive ability varies in all people autistic or not. And so as a parent of a, a child who's non-autistic but has intellectual disability, I was stigmatizing my own son without even realizing it. Because I was basically saying, just because this person looks and appears this way, their brain is, is brilliant. Well, you know, well, maybe their brain isn't. Maybe the person, maybe their brain is just whatever brain they have. And they're still a human being. And by virtue of that, they should be respected. Their needs should be met and they should be accommodated. So I think that it, it sometimes it, you have to distill it down to so to such a granular level and kind of start from in, inside. And I, I've started, I've changed, like I used to be really, really a lot more militant and I still feel that way in my heart, but I've learned that, you know, you get more flies with feces, you know, and honey than you do with, I don't know, ammonia, I'm not sure. And so I, I try to go with, I try to look at people's intent Listen, their impact. I mean, it, again, it's variable. In certain circumstances, you you have to there has to be you have to draw a line, or you you know compromise can be dangerous or harmful. But in others, like sometimes I just try to you know share another perspective or um, provide some resources. Everyone's not a lost cause, so it, it's hard to say. Um, and um, do we? I don't know if we have any additional questions, or if we still have a little time. I'm hoping we still do. I, I think we have time for one more. Okay, great. Um, so this question is, uh, so continuing our learning about neurodiversity and intersectionality as a university, can you speak to the impact of traditional education systems and the impact on perpetuating stigma? Oh my goodness. 
Um, and I and this may sound like a traitor to my colleagues in academia, but y'all know I'm telling the truth when I say this. I think traditional education is one of the biggest drivers of stigma that exists. Um, um, from K through 12 to higher ed, I think there are so many the the way the way things need to be done the um, the the rules you know and the expectations and the um, you know everything from you know like it's I just think about how students undergrad and grad students are so gaslit you know for not knowing everything when they walk in the door and I think that from very early on the way someone moves or the way someone talks the way someone acts either you label them out you know you, either you they get sent away, we've got the school to prison pipeline type of thing, or, or they get segregated and get less of an education, or they're forced into this norm. I mean, or they're forced into this traumatizing um, situation where you have to be something that you're not or be you know, at all times or have to do this to be seen or to be heard or to be validated. Um, we don't honor the way that, even if we take it outside of autism, we don't honor the way that different people learn and communicate. Um, we don't honor the need for big body play and for or, you know, some, for autonomy, um, the way our system is set up from the time of day that we start school to the, the way we cohort, um, you know, individuals to the standardized testing, um, to the lack of uh, being able to look at um, multiple, um, you know, ways that people learning preferences and, and multimodal methods. I think that it, you know, and then even the special education label, you know, in some places they, they're doing it right. There are some places that Special education means anything that's not the general ed curriculum. So that means gifted and talented. That means fine arts and music. That means, you know, if you need, you know, if you need extra help, if you have disability services, that means career and tech. That means anything that's different. That means environmental or agricultural curriculum. So those people to the special education is a sign of pride. It just means, oh, okay, my kid needs or does or likes something different. Um, and then in uh, many other places, special means less than. It means it's that hallway down there that you never go to. It's those people who come into the cafeteria, you know, about 15 minutes after everybody else or before and then leave. Um, it's the short bus. It's the, you know, it, it's, it's just, you know, problematic. And there's a reason why so many of the youth who get accommodations in um, K through 12 choose not to disclose when they go to higher ed because they are trying to, they're still disabled, but the experience that they've been taught is such that it isn't helpful for, pe to, for people to know who you are. And um, I, um, there's a syllabus statement that, you know, most professors have to read to their students or share. And so prior to the pandemic, you know, when we were in face-to-face, I would read through it and I never liked it, you know, but you have to still read it. I would paraphrase it. But after doing so, I would explain to them that you are entitled to this. This is your tax dollars. This is your, your right as a, you know, as a resident of this state, as a person in this country, you can, you can, you know, and you can choose to use these services or you cannot, but there's nothing, you're not taking away from anyone from doing it. You're not harming anyone. It's something that you're entitled to and that you deserve. And I would explain to them that I wish I had known about my disabilities when I was younger. And I wish I had known through school or college to be able to obtain some type of accommodations, how helpful it would be, it would have been for me to have, to be able to leave um, and sit somewhere quiet where I'm not gonna hear the clicking of pens or where I'm not gonna be sitting in a classroom with a buzzing that's giving me a migraine and so forth. And so I explain to them and I tell them, you know, I have a disability as well. And then I tell them about some of the accommodations that I use in my classroom, like never give me a paper. Here's where you turn things in. Here's where you email things. Here's where you, I talk about my office hours and I kind of explain the way I do things and why I do them a certain way the day that I telecommute. And I've had students come up to me and say, wow, I've never had a professor who's been disabled before. And I'm thinking you have, they just didn't tell you. And again, everyone doesn't have to disclose everything about themselves, but I feel like I'm trying to, to um, eradicate stigma by, because I have the privilege of being able to share that I am disabled and some people cannot do that safely. Um, if it makes any student feel seen, and it often has, I've had students come to me and say, I have ADHD or I'm dyslexic or oh, I'm autistic too, I just didn't want anybody to know. And now, you know, I've had students who learn and when they find out that I let them turn things in different ways, like I have, they have alternatives for assignments or communication, um, it has really helped them dig in and blossom to themselves. And when I taught in K through 12, I had a sensory corner and sensory devices and my neurotypical students use them more than my stable students actually. It ultimately, it's something that we all need, you know, is to be able to have, you know, our brains honored. 
And so thank you so much, everyone, for, um, for being here. You all have been great. I, I realize it's one uh, minute after the hour, and I want to be respectful of your time. We um, want to thank you so much for this invaluable talk. It's so thought provoking and, you know, wishing we could continue each question and topic, I think could be an hour in itself. So before we all say goodbye, and I'm going to unmute everyone so they can say thank you. Um, do you have any up information about when the, the book will be released? Um, yes, so it, it's originally supposed to be released at the end of November, um, and now we're, we're thinking there might be some publication delays and it might not be released until 2023, which we're really disappointed about, but we're, we're, it's, there's a few contributors, it's an edited collection, there's a few contributors who are having some health complications, and so our choice is proceed without them or wait, and so we're we, most of us are voting to wait. <laughs> um, and so, so I, you know, I do apologize for that, but I will um, kind of share updates about that. But in the meantime, like, you know, I mentioned, I have some other books, one that I recommend and that a few of you will be winning today, Sincerely Your Autistic Child. If a person Googles that, it's from Bleak and Press. It's pretty much anywhere books are, Waterstones, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Target, Walmart. And um, it's, there's an audio version, an e version, and there's also a regular you know, book version. And it's, um, you know, the 28 chapters of autistic people of different backgrounds, older, younger, and so forth, sharing what they wish their parents would have known and what their parents have done right. And things that, you know, and then the, the forward and conclusion are written by parents who are non-autistic, but kind of sharing their experiences of, you know, of parenting their children and how it's been helpful for them to take their expertise. Cause you know, your kid, right? You're there every day with that kid. You may not share their neurology, but you know, your kid. And this person knows what it's like to be an autistic kid put your knowledge together, what you know of your kid and what they know of the neurology. And together you've got, you know, a lot more power, um, a lot more powerful situation than either of you have alone. Well, thank you again. And when the book is available, we can send that out to this list. And we, awesome. people were asking in the chat if we plan to share the recording and we do plan to do that as well. So we wanna thank you and respect your time. You are all able to unmute if you wanna shout a thank you. Also, thank Not you, quietly for though. Yeah. Jules and Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> quietly, thank you. Or thank put you it so in the much. chat. Yes. Thanks again. Thank you.